This is the second of two videos about dry eye. Hello, my name is Craig Blackwell. I'm an ophthalmologist in Santa Cruz, California. In this video, we will look further into the mechanism of dry eye, then talk about diagnosis and treatment. Remember, this is for your information and does not replace consultation with your ophthalmologist. Let's start with a quick review of what we talked about in part one. First, we discussed that a healthy tear film is needed for good vision, comfort, and health of the cornea. Second, the tear film has three layers. On the surface of the cornea is a mucin layer that allows the tears to spread out over the surface. The middle layer is a watery layer produced by the lacrimal gland, and on the surface is a layer of oil that reduces evaporation. Dry eye usually starts with a decrease in tear production or increased evaporation. Those initial events are the first stage in a cycle of progressive damage. The tear film becomes unstable and concentrated, which causes damage to the cells on the surface of the cornea. That in turn triggers the process of inflammation, which causes more corneal damage and affects the lacrimal gland. That is where we left off after part one. Since there are a number of potential causes here, successful treatment depends on identifying the particular cause and directing treatment that way. Now, when someone comes in with complaints that suggest dryness, here is the general approach. One, what are the symptoms? Is there a pattern, and how severe are they? Two, examine the eyelids and cornea for clues we will talk about further on. Three, measure the amount of tears that are produced. From these, we rate the general level of dry eye dysfunction and decide on treatment. Symptoms range from an occasional mild sandy feeling and blurred vision, happening only in a particular drying situation, to, all the time, irritated, painful, and sensitive to light. In this table, the symptoms are shown correlated with increasing degrees of corneal involvement. It's very helpful if you can figure out if there is a pattern to your symptoms. One common pattern would be worse in the wind or with forced air heating. Frequently, people are bothered while reading or working at the computer. This is because when you concentrate on something visually, your blink rate drops to half or less of normal. Your tears don't get spread out, and there's more evaporation. Some people wake up at night feeling very dry, sometimes like the lids are stuck to the cornea. Finding these sorts of patterns is quite useful at directing treatment. We look at the lids to see that they are in good position and that blinking covers the cornea. Sometimes the lid edges will be turned in or out. Sometimes they don't close well. We are also looking for other facial problems like rosacea and seborrhea, though we are not going to cover those in this talk. Looking at the lids through the microscope, we are looking at two areas. At the front of the lid, we are looking for signs of blepharitis. That would be redness of the skin and debris like flakes of skin around the base of the lashes. At the back of the lid, we're looking to see if the openings of the meibomian glands are open or plugged. The tear film. Where the lid con contacts the eye, there's a little meniscus of tears. Is it normal size, small, or absent? There may be clumps of mucus floating in the tear film. And breakup time. After instilling a drop of dye, we can actually watch how long it takes the tear film to break up. More than 10 seconds is good. If it takes two seconds, that's not very stable and suggests a problem with the oil glands. The cornea is the centerpiece of this drama. The dye we put in stains areas on the corneal surface which are damaged. In mild dry eye, there may be scattered dots of stain, something like pits on the surface of an orange peel. With moderate dryness, the staining increases in density and begins to group in patches. With advanced disease, clouding starts to occur. This indicates damage to the cells on the surface of the cornea and is the main stimulus for inflammation. We can get a fair measure of the amount of tears you produce by doing what's called a Schirmer test. That involves placing a strip of filter paper in the edge of the eyelid and measuring how much is wetted in five minutes. In this picture, a test strip is laying on top of the box. The end is yellow because of the dye placed in the eye before doing the test. The yellow part is the part that was wetted in five minutes. 
It extends to the shoulder of the strip just under 10 millimeters. This is below normal, indicating borderline dryness. Wetting of 1 to 2 millimeters is very dry. Putting all these observations together helps to determine the cause. Decreased aqueous production, increased evaporation, blepharitis, or mechanical eyelid problems. And there may be more of one of these going on simultaneously. Rating the overall severity helps decide how aggressive we need to be with treatment. If aqueous production is down, then we have the following range of options. For mild symptoms with minimal to no corneal damage, then simple lubricating drops are the easiest first line of treatment. These are like cysteine, refresh, blink, etc. Basically, they are saline plus a thickening agent that attempts to mimic the lubricating action of your own tears. Using just saline alone is not helpful because you wash out the lubricating substances that you need. You remember we talked about trying to identify a pattern. If you know your symptoms come on while working at a computer, put in a drop before you start work, then as often as you need to be comfortable. If you know it happens in the evening watching TV, put in a drop before you settle in. If you need more than three or four drops a day, consider using preservative-free drops because that's easier on the surface of the eye. They usually come in individual packages containing a few drops in each. The tear supplements I mentioned before are of medium thickness. If the drops help but you need a little more duration, then there are thicker formulations that have a name like liquid gel or liquid gel. For those who have trouble at night or on waking in the morning, the regular tears may not be thick enough to last through the night. For this, there are thicker choices going from Celluvisc, a very thick tear, Gentile Gel in a tube, and Refresh PM, an ointment. The last two are very thick and blur vision, so they would be used last thing before bed. And in more extreme dry eye, they are sometimes used during the day. For people with dry eye from reduced aqueous production and tears are not enough, then there are more tools in our kit. I will talk about two, punctal plugs and a drop called restasis. The diagram shows how tears normally drain from the eye. The opening of the tear duct is called the punctum. We are able to insert a small, soft silicon plug into the punctal opening to block the drainage duct. Usually we only put a plug in one of the two puncta. Blocking half the drain system helps retain more of your own tears. If there is any kind of problem, it can be easily removed. Restasis we will cover in a minute. If there are signs of blepharitis, then that must be addressed. Remember, that was redness of the skin of the edge of the eyelid and flaky debris around the base of the lashes, usually coming from overgrowth of normal bacteria. The first step in controlling this is regular lid hygiene. One way to do this is by adding a drop of baby shampoo to a warm, damp washcloth. Close your eyes and lay the washcloth over the lids for a few minutes, then gently scrub along the edge of the eyelid to clean off the oily debris. Then rinse and dry. The soap has antibacterial action and cleaning the debris reduces the hiding places for the bacteria. There are also commercial pads available for this if you want. If the blepharitis is more stubborn, then we can add either an antibiotic ointment or drops to the eyelid, sometimes an oral antibiotic, and if there's a lot of inflammation, we may add cortisone in the beginning to get things to quiet down. Once the blepharitis is quieted, it can usually be kept under control by regular hygiene measures like the scrubs on a nightly basis, and sometimes local antibiotics intermittently. Increased evaporative tear loss is often from problems with the oil-producing meibomian glands. We see that as decreased tear breakup time, usually along with plugged oil gland openings. The plugging comes about because the oil has become thicker. The way to deal with this is to do the same warm compress as above, but in this case add massage to the lid margin afterward. You are trying to get the oil moving out from the glands. There can also be inflammation of the meibomian gland, so sometimes antibiotics and steroids are useful. The antibiotics have the added benefit that they change the oil chemistry, making it thinner. Recently, there are also a couple of nutritional suggestions that may be helpful. Flaxseed oil to help 
thin the oil secretions and omega-3 fatty acids to help with anti-inflammatory activity. Regarding mechanical lid problems, we will only note that they, that they require a surgical solution. When symptoms have reached a moderate level and there are more corneal signs and inflammation has set in, then we need a higher level of treatment. The cycle of dry eye works this way. Initial corneal damage leads to inflammation, which leads to further corneal damage and lacrimal gland damage, then more dryness. To break that cycle, you first need to quiet the inflammation, both on the surface of the eye and then also in the lacrimal gland. In addition to artificial tears, we are now adding anti-inflammatory medications. In the short term, we can reduce inflammation by adding steroids. These come in different strengths depending on how much effect we need. These are generally quite safe for the short term, but have potential complications in the longer term, which we want to avoid. A way to approach this for the long term is to use a medication called Restasis. This is an anti-inflammatory medication that doesn't have the side effects of steroids. Restasis is a brand name for cyclosporin. It is a drop that is instilled twice a day. Its worst side effect seems to be stinging. The point of using Restasis is to quiet the inflammation and allow the ocular surface to heal itself. With Restasis alone, that takes about six to eight weeks. So sometimes we pair Restasis with steroid drops for the first couple of weeks to get a head start on the inflammation. After tapering the steroids, the Restasis is continued for six months or longer. How long is currently open to question? Quieting the inflammation allows the surface of the cornea to heal. As the lacrimal gland has a chance to repair itself, hopefully it can produce more tears. And there are other beneficial effects on the meibomian glands and the cells that produce the mucin. As a review, I would make the following points. The tear film and the system that produces and maintains it are more complicated than you might expect. A healthy tear film is important for clear vision, comfort, and corneal health. The main thing that has changed in recent years is the recognition of the role of inflammation and that it acts at a deeper level, progressively damaging the cornea and lacrimal gland. We have a number of tools available to us. I have included the main ones, but there are too many to cover everything in this summary. Probably the biggest factor in success is realizing that this is going to require ongoing attention on your part. You need to be consistent using drops and lid scrubs and whatever other measures are necessary.